thank you very much for inviting me. I, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I've written a lot about Poland and what I've called the emergence of the new Polish capitalism. So it's really encouraging to be um, in uh, another, another country that was a uh, former Soviet country, um, sort of engaging in debates about, about class and, and struggle. Uh, the, art, the lecture that I'm going to present um, is based on an article that I wrote in International Socialism, the journal, about, about a year ago. And the reason that I wrote it wasn't out of some sort of abstract uh, notion, but because I thought that coming from my students, coming from sections of the left, there were some ideas about globalisation and particularly about capital that were really not, uh, not helpful for understanding class and understanding the potential for struggle. And some of the common sense assumptions that were out there was a very wide-reaching assumption that there was a hemorrhaging of jobs from what's called the Global North to the Global South. And I'll be critiquing that idea later on. Um, that in Southeast Asia, and obviously China in particular, was a, a new magnet for foreign investment, and this was at the expense of domestic jobs. People, for example, in the UK were writing about the fact that uh, Brit the UK is now a, a knowledge economy and that all production is going to places like China. And in this notion of globalisation is the idea that uh, transnational corporations are not only powerful and footloose, but also they're difficult to challenge. So these ideas are, are very much um, around as part of the common sense, which is what I'm trying to challenge. And the whole issue of the movement of capital has been um, you know, quite a, a hot political issue. So, for example, in the um, presidential election, one of the arguments that Obama used against uh, Romney was that he worked for a firm which was exporting jobs to other parts of the world through outsourcing and offshoring. Uh, the US big trade union confederation, the AFL-CIO, also has talked about China as a, a threat, as exerting downward pressure on the, on the wages of workers. So, um, you know, this is one of the themes that comes up time and time again. Quite interestingly, and I, I've kept this quote quite long, other Marxists have taken quite a different view. And uh, someone called John Smith writes that the vast wave of outsourcing production processes to low-wage countries was a strategic uh, response to the, uh, the crisis that emerged in the 1970s. And, you know, actually, that's true, although it was part of a, a much bigger reorganisation of capital in terms of fragmenting some functions, uh, actually large firms declining in size but creating uh, new, uh, new social relationships. So the first part of that quote is, 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 is I think, probably um, self-evident. But the second half is really rather dangerous because it talks about the fact that this um, was because, if you like, domestic ruling class were reluctant to reverse the expensive concessions that have helped convert the workers of the global north into ba passive bystanders or even accomplices to, their subjugate, to the subjugation of the rest of the world. And I think that's quite dangerous because it's quite divisive. So what you've got in, this, in these two accounts is you've got some very contradictory ideas. If you think about workers in the core capitalist countries, 
Simultaneously, they're victims of unfair competition, or in another view, they're bystanders or accomplices in exploitation. Similarly, workers in the global south are simultaneously perpetrators of unfair competition and also super exploited in the race to the bottom. So these are very contradictory conclusions which emerge from those views. And I think for socialists it raises some um, you know, important political questions because it's actually very divisive um, in that workers in the core capitalist countries and the so-called global south are seen as having different interests. That it has implicit in it a sort of passivity that both groups are powerless in the face of uh, supermobile global capital. And it rules out solidarity because what it does is it emphasises competition. So what we need is we need a much better account, a much better understanding of what's happening to global capital and what challenges and opportunities it throws up for, um, for socialists and workers. And I'm going to ha ha deal with five key questions. First of all, um, in the first two parts, I'm going to use fairly light touch sort of Marxist analysis to talk about the fact that the mobility <coughs> of capital is, those accounts are quite often exaggerated, simplistic, they only take account of a small section of capital. Secondly, that there has been a tendency to write out the state, which I will argue continues to play a critical role in processes of accumulation. Thirdly, that the so-called spatial fix, the idea that, that, that I borrowed from uh, David Harvey, whereby capitalists can move their production in order to get a, some temporary advantage, is only temporary. And that fourthly, and you know, critically important, that wherever capital settles, wherever it settles, then it's met with resistance from workers. And finally, and um, I, that how do we understand these things theoretically? And what I argue it is that really the only theory that, that starts to open up understanding these other things is the, um, it is the, the notions of combined uneven development. So these are the arguments that I'm going to, I'm going to go through. So let's just start off with a quote that I think probably people are, uh, are very familiar with, which is the quote from Marx, and it explains actually both periods of expansion of, of capitalism, the huge uh, geographical expansion um, in terms of markets, in terms of trying to, what he called, annihilate space by time. And of course in the 19th century that was railways, canals, and in the 20th century a whole different range of technology has managed to enable capitalists to annihilate um, space by time. So that's a very general statement of the dynamics of the, the system. But actually, if we come down to the concrete manifestations, then that whip of competition um, poses a whole range of dilemmas for capitalists because there are you know, endless ways in which they can try to do that. There are endless ways of exploiting workers. There are endless combinations of how they organise with um, other, um, other capitalists through suppliers, through competitors, whether or not they band together, whether they're in competition 
and you know, a whole menu of different, um, different arrangements. And what's emerged, and there's a huge literature on this, which some of you might be familiar with, is very, very fragmented and very, very complex value chains, both to extract surplus value and also to try and realize it. So whether or not you look at neoclassical economics or some perhaps crude Marxism, you know, the dilemma is that capitalists, one you know, essential insight of Marx is that capitalists don't know what other capitalists are doing and they have to make decisions within a, a whole broad range of possibilities. And you know what we see is we see that there is both a, a propulsion for deconcentration and also concentration. And what you get is very powerful firms that come to dominate um, value chains. And I picked on two particularly, who I think are um, very um, arch examples of this. If you take Tesco's, you know, Tesco's have, uh, are very adept and good at um, exploiting their workers in terms of contracts, in terms of how they organise labour. But they're also very good at annihilating um, space through time. They compete with other supermarkets by with very sophisticated logistics, and they extract a greater share of uh, surplus value because what they do is they squeeze smaller firms down the value the value chain, and that's a very similar picture with uh, with IKEA. Um, very very sophisticated in terms of how they organise their production, and the reason that they are in the position they are, is that they actually can do it better than other firms with which they're, with, with which they're competing. So that's by way of an introduction. I, I want to turn now to look at um, each of the arguments that are, I've set out. And the first one, very crudely, is that accounts of the mobility of capital are very um, simplistic. And I just want to look at two things briefly. First of all, some very broad divisions of labour in the global economy, and then the notion of fixed and mobile capital. So I've just taken a, a couple of ta recent tables from the um, statistics that are produced by the United Nations, which are, are quite useful. And these are figures for foreign direct investment. Now this is a, a very partial measure. It doesn't take into account inter-firm uh, transactions, and it doesn't take into account financial flows. So it is only, if you like, a proxy for the movement of one sort of capital in a global and you know, what we see there is a picture where there is a slight decline in the amount of uh, movement towards uh, developed countries. European Union, still very important. The growth in developing, uh, share of developing countries. But contrast the share of mobile investment of um, Southeast Asia which is mainly accounted for actually by China, and the entire African subcontinent, which accounts for under 4%, and even that is concentrated in a very small number of countries. So that's an interesting but fairly imperfect look at flows of um, foreign investment. Perhaps what's a bit more interesting if we look at, for last year, what were the, the top 15 countries. And still, the US is right at the top in, in terms of receiving um, inward foreign direct investment 
followed by China and, um, and Russia. Quite a lot of um, things there that are rather distorting. If you take Brazil and Australia, I think a large amount of that would be accounted for by Chinese foreign direct investment in their whole complex of resources. But very interesting, um, the United Kingdom and Ireland, still quite significant players. And before I came out, I just checked what the population of Ireland is. It has four million people. At four million people, it's in 10th place, and that's because it's very much an economy that's dominated by um, foreign uh, transnational corporations in things like IT um, uh, and, and so on. So that's quite, quite an interesting picture as well. And again, it underlines the way that China really uh, distorts any flows to Southeast Asia and completely dominates them. Finally, and I just thought using uh, World Trade Organization statistics, it was worth looking at what was happening in a number of, of different sectors. And just running through them very quickly, in iron and steel, we can see there's been a definite uh, shift towards production in China. That's also very true of integrated circuits. Clothing, um, quite an interesting picture because Europe has actually increased its share of exports in clothing, partly because production has shifted from the core countries to some of the more peripheral countries. But then you look at uh, cars, you look at pharmaceuticals, then those are completely still dominated by the, uh, by the European Union. So those are the big picture, but what I'm going to go on to talk about later on is how within that big picture there are tensions, there are contradictions, and that um, there can be all sorts of... Uh, reversals and we should just be cautious about what we read of that. Now, um, I could have done a picture of circuits of capital, but in fact I've just put up four pictures instead. And the accounts of the mobility of capital, I would argue, are confined to a very few sections of capital. Part of capitalist production requires jobs, resources, and investment in terms of social reproduction, in terms of training, education, skills, and health, because um, investing in those is absolutely critical for competition, whether it's the, if you like, social reproduction or whether it's physical investment. So a whole raft of jobs to do with physical investment, whether it's airports or roads, <laughs> are fixed. Those jobs are, are by definition fixed in one place, as are jobs to do with um, care for the elderly, uh, schools, education, and so on. And one thing that I won't take up, but I think Joseph Chinara might take up later on, is we have to understand where those jobs fit into a, an account of surplus value and our understanding of class. Because some people sideline those in some way as, as being less, less important. There are a whole range of other jobs to do with call centres that are super mobile. It doesn't take much to move those jobs to other parts of the world. And things like manufacturing in cars are you know, relatively, relatively more mobile. So, although I've chosen to do it by photographs rather than a diagram of circuits of capital, if we are looking at class, if we're looking at jobs, if we're looking at where people work, we have to understand the totality of capital rather than understand it in terms of simply um, a few sections. So 
even mobile capital faces um, a whole number of um, constraints. So clothing, electronics, uh, computer software, those are not you know, automatically and necessarily related in um, low wage economies. There's a whole raft of costs, of calculations that, um, if you like, capitalists take into account when deciding where to uh, locate, uh, locate particular, uh, particular bits of production. And for example, if we take the case of um, autos, cars and vehicles, then those actually um, demand very high sum costs. Now, if you're moving uh, a call centre, I guess the costs are pretty low. If you're building a new car factory, then that actually you're committing capital for um, really quite a number of decades uh, before you would think about moving again. So rather than seeing in the, in the car industry, rather than seeing uh, production simply moving to, um, simply moving to low cost economies, it's much more organized regionally. So if you look at the American industry, it's a very complex organization between the north South of America with the uh, ironically named right to work states where wages are, are much cheaper and workers at the moment less organized in Mexico. If you look at Japan, then Japan uh, operates quite sophisticated just in time systems around countries in Southeast Asia. And in the European Union over um, a period of time, there has been a shift of some car production, especially to Hungary, to Poland, to the Czech Republic, and so on. But actually, they are still not the major producer of cars. The major producers of cars in Europe are France, Spain, and the UK. You know, not, not the cheapest. Um, well, actually, I'm going to talk about the UK becoming a a cheap location later on. So, to finish that point, I think two, two, things, two things are important. Firstly, when we talk about mobile capital, we are talking about a subset of capital. There are swathes of capital that are fixed in one place. In fact, uh, if I have longer, there's a very interesting relationship about, about migration and foreign direct investment. That some capitals uh, look for lower costs. Other capitals, when they're fixed, actually try and bring workers in from other countries to do some of the worst paid jobs, for example, in, the, in healthcare. And secondly, that even where capital is mobile, it faces constraints. And it is only a small number of sections, particularly clothing, footwear, electronics, that are, are completely mobile. And we, we have to understand that when we're looking at what the emerging patterns are. Now, the second argument that I want to turn to is the way that in debates about globalisation, the state has been, not in every account, but the state has been either written out or downplayed. Similarly, in accounts of uh, in, um, neo neoliberalism, the state tends to be sidelined. But what I want to argue is although the role of the state might change, it is absolutely central and pivotal to the accumulation of capital. And uh, I've uh, put up another straw man here to, to knock down. But this is uh, indicative of some of the arguments that are put forward. Economic globalisation increasingly 
imposes on the world a new pattern of ter territorial specialization organized by global markets. Organized by global markets, not by nation states, the free flow of factors of production have created a single world economy. And what I'm going to argue is that there is not a free flow of factors of production, that markets don't exist as some abstract concept, they are constructed, and the state is absolutely pivotal in, um, in a number of, of ways. But still, the state is the territorial organisation that uh, frames a fixed geographical environment in which accumulation takes place, which leads to interstate riv rivalry in terms of producing the best conditions for, uh, for accumulation. And just to reduce that to some fairly simple ideas, um, the state has to provide physical in infrastructure, transport, energy, airports. It has to produce the institutional architecture in terms of the relationship between capitals on its own territory, and what the rules are, um, the legal structures are, what the rules are between capital and labour, which are usually which are always in favour of capital rather than labour, but need to engender some uh, basic uh, protections. They provide the conditions for the reproduction and enhancement of labour, so that, for example, um, universities these days, um, not only in the UK, are seen as business organisations, business facing, that actually churns out graduates who are going to raise the productivity of capital within its own boundaries. So notions of learning um, and education and critical thinking, of course, are sidelined. And very importantly, you know, very, very importantly, nation states um, bargain with other nation states in order to protect their own sections of capital. And they do that through uh, long rounds of negotiations with the World Trade Organizations. So, as we'll see later on, the uh, um, bands of hostile brothers who sometimes cooperate and sometimes, um, sometimes uh, are, are aggressive and compete with each other. But beyond that, beyond those very basic functions, um, every nation state and actually many regions are engaged in subsidy wars that every country every region competes very fiercely to try and win any mobile capital to within its own boundaries and to keep what it already what it already um, what it already has there um, in fact there's a whole industry whole industries around regional uh, development organisations who try to um, who try to court and attract um, attract capital uh, to the extent that, for example, when I was looking at Poland, General Motors said that they were going to go and locate their Opel factory there, and uh, there were some special economic zones, places with high unemployment, and. Um, General Motors didn't like the look of any of those places, so the Polish government created a special economic zone especially for them. So that's the power of some of the, some of the larger firms. Um, I don't know why I chose this, but the film industry is quite interesting. There is intense, intense competition to try and attract sections of the film industry to particular continents. North America, Europe, New Zealand and Australia <coughs> and within those places intense competition within Europe to try and get um, to try and, and get location there. So to the extent that for example in New Zealand New Line Cinema which made Lord of the Rings 
uh, managed to clock up tax, rate, tax breaks of about three to four hundred million dollars. And then that wasn't quite enough for them, so they said, well, actually, we'd like some more subsidies, and we're not very keen on the labour legislation, so we want to change, you to change that. So it's more, uh, more in the favour of uh, profit and capital. So um, you know, that, that's one particular example. If you look in America, if you look in America, you can see that 40 states um, spent 1.4 billion on tax credits, write-offs, grants, and so on, and only six states weren't offering um, concessions for movie production. So at the moment, um, one of the most popular areas is, is uh, Louisiana. So these, um, these film companies don't simply arrive. They negotiate intensely with national and local states, local states particularly, to extract the best possible deal that they can get. Um, I think it's very ironic that you know, America uh, markets American capitalism markets itself as the you know the land of the free, the land of free markets, the land of competition, whereas actually the reality of how American capitalism functions uh, that could be hardly further from the truth. And um, I've just taken a quote from Global Shift by uh, Peter Dickin. And he quotes the chairman of a large Swiss group that says, talking about America, states are more willing to pay for new roads, retrain workers, offer huge tax breaks. That is a competitive package that not many parts of the world can match when you look at how productive US workers are and where the dollar is. So it's not even that America is one amongst many countries that provide subsidies, they are actually very, very high. So you could look through semiconductors, which haven't all gone to China. You could look at the car industry. Both of those receive huge subsidies. And particularly, there is an emerging pattern of those industries going to parts of the American South, as I said, where wages are cheaper and workers at the moment are less organized. But it doesn't stop there, because as I said earlier, um, in order to shape global divisions of labour, uh, the national capitalist class are fight very hard to organise the rules of trade in their own interests. And what you've had is you've had a fall in things like tariffs and import quotas, and at the same time, a rise in something called anti dumping um, duties. And this is a, a new form of protectionism. Um, the way that it worked is basically, it's written by the European Union and America. If they decide that China or India or somewhere else is making goods too cheaply, it's not scientific, not at all, then they are deemed to be unfair competitors and they put a tax on them to stop them. Similarly, currency wars. If you follow the um, uh, sort of rhetoric fired from China and America, the US accuses China of keeping the renminbi uh, artificially low, and China say, well, you've got quantitative easing and you've kept the dollar artificially low. So, you know, a whole ways in which, um, in, in which countries can intervene. And anti-dumping, is a, a very useful tool for the capitalist classes because they can simply target any sector they don't like in another country and impose uh, tariffs and taxes on them. Okay, so I hope that it's clear from what I've argued that far from the state um, sitting on the sidelines, the state plays a pivotal role in a whole number of ways in terms of influencing production that takes place within its geographical, geographical boundaries. Now, the 
third argument that I want to come to, which I think is very important, is that when firms move to other countries on the basis of low costs, and I'm talking about costs as a package, then those advantages can only be, if you like, a temporary fix for the problem of competition and falling profits. Because decisions that firms make individually change the dynamic and collectively what they do is in turn change the relative cost of production. And I'll talk about this later on as the um, contradiction between um, wanting to differentiate between different locations and the propulsion for profit to be equalised. So any, so firms and uh, bosses, managers take a decision in isolation, not knowing what other firms are doing, and by doing that individually, collectively, they change the dynamic and the relative cost of locations. And I'm just going to use the very concrete example of that, uh, of, uh, of China. Um, now, people talk about the 21st century as, the, uh, as the, the, the century of China. And undoubtedly, the growth rates in China are absolutely um, eye-watering. They are enormous. However, there are really emerging contradictions, tensions, and problems within that model. Uh, because there is no longer the um, endless stream of very compliant migrant workers who will do monotonous and exhausting work. And labor markets now are incredibly tight with actually more vacancies than workers looking for work. And as we'll talk about later on, a growing confidence of workers not to put up with the pay and conditions they're offered. So over the last two weeks, there have been 40,000 workers on strike asking for better wages, better benefits, better conditions of work. And that's only one strike. Um, the increase in protests and strikes, particularly amongst the migrant workers who, uh, 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 who produce things in the factory, is absolutely enormous. But what that does is in terms of a location where um, companies can resolve the problems that they have of, of, of profits, then it means that that location, over a period of time, actually yields less money and uh, lower levels of profit. So the evidence is very interesting. Um, Mikey still produces in China. It's moved a lot of its production to Vietnam. The hourly rates of wages in Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia and Cambodia are much lower. So there's a real shift. So, for example, um, you know, China's an enormous place. But in the south, opposite Hong Kong, um, in the Shenzhen area, most clothing and uh, footwear companies have either moved to other places in China, moved to home, or moved to other locations in Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia. Um, just before Christmas, I was doing some interviews in a place in China called Xiamen, which is opposite Taiwan, a special economic zone, and you know, it was really evident there that labour markets were incredibly problematic. The whole area, 70% of workers were migrant workers, compared with 30% 10 years before. Wages had risen enormously. Um, as I'll talk about in a minute, factories had started to introduce technology, or had closed down completely and outsourced their own production. 
uh, and you know, really not the model of social relations that people normally associate with China. The Boston Consulting Group, which is very interesting, they produce very interesting reports because basically they look at the total costs in a particular area and they are advising bosses where they might move to. So one that came out last year um, really started to argue that China was becoming very expensive and when they did all the arithmetic, the southern states of America appeared to be much more attractive. A new report came out last week which, interestingly, showed that when you take account of all costs, that the UK is one of the cheapest manufacturing destinations in Western Europe. And actually, as I said, far from uh, the UK being simply a knowledge economy, it's the fourth, one of the fourth largest producer of cars in Europe. So, I won't leave that slide up for very long. It just talks about the sort of problems from the point of view of uh, capitalists in terms of um, wages going up, um, workers being more demanding, and the original comparative advantage that was so clearly there five, ten years ago is actually um, deteriorating. And of course, the other option for, uh, for capitalist firms is not simply the option of moving. There's another series of options, which is substituting workers for technology, which is also only um, a short run advantage. And again, I, I take the example of Foxconn. And Foxconn, again, shows the problem that they have of uh, low wage production. Now, Foxconn is a pretty infamous firm. It's a Taiwanese subcontractor for Apple. It employs one million workers in China. And on a scale that I've never seen anywhere in the world, factory, dormitory, factory, dormitory, because nearly everyone is uh, a migrant worker. And they have relatively high rates of pay, but the work is repetitive and mind-numbingly tedious. And this quote shows the inside of a factory. Each worker focuses on a single action, like putting a sticker on the front of an iPhone, and uh, apparently it takes five days and 325 steps to assemble an iPad. The level of boredom is apparent because two or three years ago there were a number of suicides from the young workers who worked in this factory, which is indicative of the enormous alienation and, and boredom of working for such companies. Very interesting quote from the Taiwanese um, uh, managing director. As human beings are also animals, to manage one million animals gives me a headache. So, when workers are compliant, when their wages are relatively low, when you've managed to increase your profit levels, that's worth doing. When wages are going up and workers are starting to make increased demands, then it becomes a problem. So, they're planning to diversify to Brazil, Mexico, Eastern Europe, and interestingly, within China, they're planning to install robots to supplement the workforce. And again, very interesting that China's comparative advantage, very much seen as being cheap labour. Lots of firms that I talked to had started or were um, starting to seriously contemplate introducing more machinery. 
understand divisions of labour as being dynamic is because the calculus constantly changes. That the, the, um, the whip of competition, uh, the drive to either stop profits falling or increase profits mean that bosses continually review their operations. And an alternative strategy is to return some production to home. So another example, uh, Philips Electronics Factory <coughs> at the moment located in China where those uh, shavers are assembled by hundreds of, or thousands of workers by hand. Now they've transferred some of that production back to the Netherlands where they've got a new generation of technology and, and robotics. So you know, there is a huge menu of options for capitalist firms. How quickly technology will be uh, adopted isn't predictable. It will be uneven between firms. That firms that are more innovative will adopt new technologies, will adopt new methods. Others will have to do the same to keep pace with their rivals. But firms can only steal an advantage in the short term because the system as a whole, that will eventually lead to falling profits and a new round of looking for what strategies they can use to prevent profits falling. Okay, um, fourthly, in the account that people give about multinationals and new divisions of labour, then workers are quite often completely written out of the, of the picture. And it is the case that um, in the short term, some groups of workers actually lose out from location moving. You know, devastatingly, the closure of uh, the closure of coal pits, the closure of particular factories in parts of Europe has you know, a devastating effect on jobs in those areas, on um, the whole opportunities for working class people. And that's quite often been used, particularly in the places like the UK, to sort of write off the working class and talk about some post-industrial society. But of course, what happens is those jobs are recreated in other parts of the world. And there's a, a brilliant book by um, a US writer called Beverly Silver, and it's called Forces of Labor. And it's a, a really good book, because what it does is it brings together the theoretical with the empirical. And which I think is very, uh, very succinct. She, she says that, that volume one of Marx's Capital can be read as the history of the dialect between workers' resistance to exploitation at the point of production and the efforts of capital to overcome that resistance by constantly revolutionising production and social relations. And that's what I've been talking about, that that is the dilemma of capitalists, to extract surplus value that workers continually, sometimes actively, sometimes passively, resist. And as a result of that, bosses and capitalists continually revolutionise production and social relations. So, if we look at new sites of production, if we look at the economic miracles of the 1970s and 1980s, what those did is that they created new and militant labour movements um, in expanding mass production industries. So in Korea, in places like Brazil, in places like Spain, in places like South Africa. So you know, the inherent conflict between capital and labour 
is never resolved. It's simply shifted to a different geographical location, and it creates a new, um, a new class of workers um, and new sites of accumulation, new conflicts, and new forms of struggle. And um, I think that's very evident, not only in those places, but very evident in, uh, in China. So, right. I'm just going to finish because what I've done is I've made those four arguments and I've made them in quite a light touch way, theoretically. And what I, I want to finish with is by just talking about a way that I think that we can offer a sort of theoretical framing of those, all of those phenomena through the idea of combined and uneven development. And I just mentioned an article that I have published this year because I, I look at that actually to look at what's happened, the, the impact of the crisis. But I can't claim to be a great pioneer uh, of, of this idea. And I mentioned these aren't the only three people, but they're the three key people. Trotsky, who um, first introduced the idea, developed by George Novak in the 1970s, and more recently, a really uh, excellent and very deep sort of theoretical exposition by Neil Smith, who sadly um, died um, earlier this year, which really starts to give a, a much more spatial and uh, exposure of the whole thing. And I've just very briefly touched on some of the, what I call progressive, not Marxist, but progressive popular conceptions of capital, capitalism that this stands against. Institutionalism is incred incredibly popular, whereby you read off the success of particular capitalisms by looking at their institutions, by their banks, their labour, um, <coughs> structure of their labour markets. Ideas of the global north and global south, or core and periphery, or people who see um, change as taking place in a number of very distinct changes that every country has to go through. Now I'm just, I'm sure we could add a lot more to that, but I think combined and uneven development stands in contrast and I'm going to, to, to talk about um, what I think it offers. Just very quickly, going through the, the, the quote by Trotsky, he says, the laws of history have nothing in common with pedantic schematism. And unevenness, the most general law of the his, historic process, reveals itself most sharply and complexly in the destiny of backward countries. Under the whip of the external necessity that their backward culture is compelled to make leaps. The universal law of unevenness thus derives another law, of which a better name we call the law of combined develop development, by which we mean drawing together different stages of the journey of combining of the steps, an amalgam of archaic with more contemporary forms. A backward country assimilates the material and intellectual conquests of the advanced countries. The privilege of historical backwardness compels the adoption of whatever is in advance of any specified date, skipping a whole series of intermediate stages. Now, I, I think what that does, as I'll say in a minute, it provides a much more dynamic possibility for national capitalisms catching up and not having to go through every stage. And I think you can see that with, if you like, the restoration or, or what happened in um, the post-communist economies after 1990 and what happened in China. But actually it was Neil Smith who really took this idea of the, if you like, the whip of external necessity and he looked right into the workings of capitalism and the law of value 
to try and explain this unevenness and the constant tendency to dynamism. And what he points out is there is an essential contradiction. That there is, on the one hand, a constant tendency for differentiation rooted in the division of labour and organisation and production. That's what I've talked about a lot, how the capitalist class look for other sites of accumulation where there is differentiation, which they can exploit to their advantage. However, at the same time, there is an opposite tendency towards universalisation and the equalisation of the rate of profit. Now that really explains uh, the way in which um, if you're a spatial fix can only be temporary. The firms can initially take advantage of differences between the organisation of work and labour in different places, but ultimately as other firms go in, they alter those conditions and the rate of profit is equalised. And then you have another cycle of reorganisation and uh, recombining technology or moving to other, uh, to other destinations. And th this is a, a direct quote from Smith. Who, who makes that point, and that gives a much uh, richer understanding of what I've called second order determinations of foreign investment, of firms, of their movement, uh, by looking at these, these two tensions. Of corrosive differentiation, which continually frustrates the annihilation of space So, just put another way, that competition for markets between firms in the same industry, the exit and entry of capital from less profitable to more profitable sectors or locations leads to a general rate of profit. Competition always is a force and a drive towards equalisation. But technological and institutional change, as well as workers, struggling and fighting will continually produce a new unevenness. And just to conclude, because I'm coming up to an hour, I think what is really rich and essential about combined uneven development and what it contributes theoretically, first of all, in contrast to other theories, drivers are deep within the system. It's not institutions or superficial characteristics. It's the law of value. It's competition. And what it does is it provides two links. One between uh, what I call first and second order determinations. Those laws that are deep in the functioning of capitalism give us a way of understanding its superficial characteristics of understanding um, investment, of trade, the actions of firms. And it gives us a way of linking, if you like, the macro, the totality of capitalism, with its spatiality and its micro characteristics. And it enables a much more complex understanding uh, between countries and also within countries and regions. And lastly, it allows contradictions which enable us to understand dynamism and, and, rapid, and rapid change. And in terms of the struggle of workers, it allows us to understand how you can get coexisting quite advanced and quite backward sections and raise questions about how those can be um, brought together. Right, that's exactly an hour, so I'll... Okay, thank you, Jane. Um, now, as I've said in the beginning, we have uh, about uh, 60 minutes or so for discussion, so please raise your hands.
and uh, my two colleagues will bring you the microphone. If you have any questions or comments, uh, raise your hands. Okay. So, are there any other questions? We'll take a couple. If not, uh, I have a small question. Um, how, how much room do you think we can leave for humans that emphasize the relative immobility of capital uh, and the imperfection of competition while still holding uh, that the law of value is valid? Um, that this is a prominent objection to Marx's theory of value that uh, in capital he talks about capitalism in its ideal average, but in the real world uh, where competition is not perfect, where, where capitalism or capital is not so mobile, uh, there is, there is um, not a lot of uh, sense in talking about the law of value and the determination of values by um, uh, labor time. So, if you have any comments on that. So, any other questions, any other uh, comments? Not will take this. Right. Actually, was it working while I was talking? I think it was. Yeah. 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 So. Um, in, in terms of the first and second order determinations, uh, I guess I could rephrase that as abstract and concrete because there's I think quite often, not an opposition, but a tendency to um, use quite abstract theory to um, understand Marxist thinking, on the one hand. And uh, if you like bourgeois economics or non-Marxist economics, talk about these other very concrete manifestations. And I think um, what um, I think what combined and uneven development enables us to do is to actually make the abstract more concrete in terms of looking at the micro behaviour of firms, looking at um, agglomerations like foreign investment. Um, so it, it, it all also enables us to link the abstract and the concrete, and also, if you've got the micro and the macro, in a way that I, I think other theories, other theories don't. Um, on the second question, you might have to, have to repeat it, but just because, um, just because capital is immobile, doesn't mean that it isn't subject to the law of value or competition, because you can have, um, for example, the example that comes to mind is um, private education and private universities can only are, are immobile within one location, and yet they are competitive and subject to the law of value as a, as a service. Yeah, I, Have I misunderstood your question? No, I wanted to know what are the cutoff points? Uh, how much weight can we give to uh, those claims of immobility? I mean, if everything, if all of capital was immobile, obviously there were no competition and no law of value. Uh, so, if, for example, uh, empirical data suggested that uh, two thirds, let's say, of the world's capital is very immobile, mm -hmm. and that let's say that um, a lot of the majority of workers uh, really have fixed jobs, they have um, long term employment and are secured yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, employment. I think we should abandon the law of value. Yeah. If that happened, 
I don't know how we can speak of the formation of the general labor profit and uh, of the, let's say, two of the basic conditions of um, the capitalism, which are that the workers are free to sell their labor power and that capitalists can expel them uh, whenever they want. If they can, if they have uh, long-term employment and uh, safe, secure employment, I don't know if the law of value is still valid. Um, okay, well, some of those jobs that I've talked about as being immobile, for example, in the public sector, let's say care workers, uh, universities, actually are increasingly subject to the law of value because of increased commodification. So whereas, if you like, the jobs are, um, and what has to be done is immobile, sections of capital are. So what you've got is you've got international capital in the service sector increasingly commodifying welfare and actually sharpening um, that competition. So, in fact, changes that have taken place over the last five or ten years have actually sharpened that. So, um, within different... And then I think the other thing that I talked about earlier is within economies, there are other ways that they try and um, extract value by the use of migrant workers as well. Okay, thank you. Another round of questions and comments. Please just raise your hands and we'll bring the microphones. If no one else wants to speak, I'd like to uh, say something in response to, to Tibor's question, which is a very interesting one. Um, but I think really it, it, it does go back to the question of the abstract and the concrete, because it seems to me that the process that Marx begins in capital, of rising from the abstract law of value to more concrete determinations, is a process that we have to continue today. And particularly if you want to look at the way that the capitalist economy develops on a world scale, you can't do that without constantly introducing new determinants. Uh, the state system, Jane talked about, is one example. It's not developed in capital. We have to add it as a new determinant, which reshapes how the law of value operates. But I think it's important to say that the law of value still plays this coercive role and imposes itself on capital. And you can see that if you look at the way that new sectors of the world economy do develop. Take the example of Japan. Very interesting, go back to the early 1980s, and read the literature in America, and the literature is all about the coming war with Japan and how Japan is going to overleap America and so on. What it's based on, is, of course, is intensely high levels of exploitation of Japanese workers on the one hand, and secondly, the location of key sectors of export markets in which the Japanese uh, capitalist firms can break into the world market by combining high levels of exploitation with very, very high levels of the organic composition of capital. For a short period of time, that can lead to extraordinary high growth rates. The problem is it begins to unravel once these export markets begin to clog up, once there's renewed competition from retooled American uh, cap capitalist firms, and once you begin to get a rise in labour costs. And really from the late 1980s onwards, you see how the Japanese boom increasingly is fueled by incredibly high levels of credit, uh, an investment that can no longer develop, uh, deliver these very, very high rates of return. It's interesting because you look at China today, although growth rates are still very, very high, you see the same kind of pressures of over-accumulation of capital, which is no longer returning such a high level of profit on the one hand, and on the other hand, the drying up of this reserve army of labour, putting pressure on, on, on wage costs. So you see the way that the law of value begins to reassert itself, but always in complex and concrete ways that we have to examine at that level. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, comments? I think we have at least half an hour. criticized the peripherization discourse or the core periphery opposition 
uh, and uh, this critique that you uh, presented is very new to me, so uh, I'm uh, interested in the political uh, implications of abandoning this, this kind of discourse, uh, because it, in our uh, cases it was very important as uh, it enables, uh, enabled us to, uh, 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 to present, uh, accentuate the structural elements of uh, uh, un uh, disabling uh, the, the strategies of the peripheral uh, elites and uh, bourgeoisie to uh, become uh, what they, want, they said that uh, they would become, that if uh, we modernize our economies, we form them in the way, neoliberal way, as, uh, as they uh, uh, suggested we should do, uh, then we would come to a situation of, uh, of the ideal economies of, of I don't know, uh, capitalist core. So, perif uh, peripherization discourse was our uh, uh, position and uh, uh, was a way to critique uh, this, uh, uh, this idea. And now if you say that uh, in this way, uh, uh, with the Trotsky quote where he says that uh, uh, the, the, the country, the less developed countries have this kind of uh, good thing because they can skip a few steps uh, with introducing the newest technology and, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, is this not a way to abandon, uh, abandon our position and say, okay, but you're right, maybe we can go uh, uh, to become these uh, ideal central uh, uh, capitalist core countries that we want to be? I don't know, probably this is wrong, but I just want to see how we can evade it. Okay, we'll take a couple more, if there are any. Uh, okay, I'll just do a follow-up on this question because I think it's uh, fairly important. Uh, not at least uh, uh, given the name of this conference, yeah, the class in the periphery. And uh, basically, based uh, upon your argumentation, uh, I think one of the points can actually explain to us why, for example, on the periphery in Serbia, Croatia and other countries, uh, there was a lack of uh, direct foreign investment actually uh, following the liberal liberalization of the periphery. And that's uh, one of the most uh, important contradictions that we need to face today. And, but the other thing, uh, the other point I think that is important to state is that uh, there is still, I think, uh, a fairly good reason for us to think in terms of the periphery, uh, for example, because uh, we still have on the interstate level several agreements that make us periphery. Uh, for example, uh, the stabilization and cooperation agreement that is an agreement that uh, is signed by various uh, peripheral countries that enables uh, the liberalization of, uh, uh, of the trade between the, the core and peripheral countries, which basically always uh, sort of unveils this, uh, unveils this uh, different, uh, different uh, degree of competitiveness between these countries. And for example, our relations to the, uh, to the credit systems uh, between uh, core and peripheral countries, for example, Serbia's uh, to two, uh, okay, like seventy-five percent of Serbia's credits are in the, denominated in, in the euro. And uh, one other point is that basically, uh, yeah, uh, basically this also would lead uh, to the uh, to the dependence of the Serbian dinner. Uh, to, to the euro, and for example, these are some of the points that I'd like to to hear you comment on because I think these points do actually make a uh, uh, fairly good reason for us to think uh, still in the terms of uh, peripheral countries uh, between uh, which are actually um, which functions uh, which function between different states. Uh, sorry for my bad English, but I hope you got the question. Um, I, I think those are really, you know, really, really good questions. Um, right, just thinking, I, th I think the first person who, that, that you're saying that, that, if you like, the ruling class or the um, powerful people within a country can say, well, we can catch up 
quickly just by adopting technology. And um, again, I want to use the example of China because I think in one sense that that's the case. So if I just take the very um, simple example of this particular city or region that I went to, this special economic zone. I went to it 12 years ago and there were no private cars. I went in December and it wasn't that there were only cars, it was that they were all top of the range, black Audis and Mercedes, thousands and thousands of them, and clearly you know, a high um, standard of living. But that's accompanied by massive, massive inequality and exploitation of other groups of workers within that country. And I think one of the problems of seeing countries in terms of those labels of, I don't completely reject them, but I think there's a problem of categorizing those terms because it can underplay the impact of class you know, within that. So, you know, for example, um, somewhere like Poland, which I know much more about. Um, you know, how far is that still a peripheral economy? It's seen as more integrated, as successful, but for a layer of people, you know, for a layer of people, for another layer of people, there's high unemployment, there's poor contracts, there's visible and hidden you know, huge poverty. So, uh, I, I, I think I think the idea of a periphery can detract from that and also from the fact that within core capitalist countries there are also sort of vast inequalities. If you come to Britain and you go to London and then you go somewhere else, you could think that you are in two different worlds because of the way um, you know those inequalities work. So Perhaps I shouldn't have dismissed them. Perhaps I should have said, I think we have to be very, very cautious. Those notions of um, advanced and peripheral economies, which I think were perhaps more clear before, are less so. You know, countries like Brazil, how do we, you know, how do we theorize, how do we theorize that? Um, so, Perhaps I'm not saying that we, we reject them totally. I think we have to be very cautious in terms of not recognising inequalities between them and the existence of class rather than nation, nation state. There was another question uh, at the end. Oh, right. Uh, could, could, you, could you repeat the key? Yeah, well, uh, I think actually I just paraphrased my colleague, but uh, it was a more economic one. Uh, I think there are several economic reasons why we should speak still uh, uh, in terms of peripheral countries, but um, it's, it's more, uh, more like I wanted to hear your opinion about it, but I think you have actually answered it, so that's it. <laughs>